In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, I bear witness that there is no God but Allah, and I bear witness that Muhammad is his messenger. I greet all of you, my dear brothers and sisters, with the greeting words of peace. Assalamu alaikum. It is very good to be home, even if it's just for a few minutes. But it is good to see so many of you and to see the young uh, FOI and MGT flowering into uh, great young men and women for the cause of Islam. Uh, there's so much going on and there's so much to say to you. I'll try to get over all of the points that I have uh, to say. Uh, first, uh, I got a call last night about um, nearly midnight from Washington, D.C. Um, Minister Alim was on the phone and uh, he had good news and bad news. And the bad news was that uh, he lost uh, the election uh, and I don't consider it at all a loss. Yes, sir. I wanted him to know that, and I wanted us to know that. Yes, sir. He um, made a very, very significant showing, and there are factors that will come out that we already know about the corruption yes, of the political system. But they had judges, from what I was told today, uh, pulling the levers. And uh, many of the uh, polling, uh, voting uh, machines weren't working. And uh, you know the whole, you know the stuff that they yeah, do. Right. So they probably robbed the brother of, of the victory. The Muslims and Christians and activists were working together in a tremendous uh, effort that they put forward. And, Though some of the workers who worked so hard, you know, with very little uh, money and whatnot, uh, felt uh, a sense of disappointment. There really is nothing to be disappointed about. I think um, Thomas Edison, they say, failed many, 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 many times before he got this electric light bulb. And to me, there is no failure uh, in uh, Islam. We, we may not succeed at what we wish to succeed at when we wish to succeed at it, but we know we're going in the right direction and with the help of Allah, we keep going. Yes, sir. And uh, we will get a voice in Congress, uh, right. if not in September, then in November. And if not in November, right. then two years from now, where we will have time to prepare yes, adequate, ah. adequately right. for this kind of race. I don't want any of you to be disappointed and Minister Alim called and asked me to please thank all of you for your prayers, for your good wishes, for the charity that you gave uh, in uh, this effort. Again, there's so many good things that have happened as a result of just the brothers uh, announcing that they're running. And I felt it all over the country. Wherever I went, politicians who treated me as though I had leprosy or AIDS, uh, all of a sudden found me attractive. And uh, they began coming out to the meetings, uh, sitting on the rostrum with me, hoping to get uh, me to say something kind about them. This is positive because it's the preachers, the politicians, and the educators who are the number one holdups of the rise of our people. And when you get these three classes of persons interested and in speaking the truth, then the rise of our people is absolutely assured. 
so we have made a, a step in the right direction so I don't want any of you to be dispirited or downhearted so I thought I would tell you that right off second thing I'd like to say is I heard from sister Farrakhan today and brother Akbar and sister Maria last night and they send you all the greetings sister Farrakhan is in Ghana uh, with brother Akbar and um, they are having a, a wonderful time they stopped my daughter in Egypt and they didn't want to let her pass through with an American passport because they just knew she was not a black American she was an Egyptian faking it you know so uh, my wife had to let them know that no 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 she's my daughter and she definitely is a black American and her father is a black American and certainly I am <laughs> right <laughs> so they finally let her get out of Egypt into uh, um, West Africa uh, today is the 37th anniversary of brother uh, Farrakhan and his wife and uh, <clears throat> And I sincerely, I sincerely hope that you that are about to marry, thinking about marriage, or have jumped into it already, will find the woman or the wife or the husband of your choice and try your best to make a good and lasting, meaningful marriage. There are so many things in this life that we are tested by that can interfere with our hopes and dreams in each other. And sometimes our hopes get so dashed that divorce becomes a reality. But if we can weather the storms of marriage and in every marriage there are storms none of us are perfect and since we are not perfect in our duty to Allah then we will not be perfect in our duty one to the other and if we can have the mind and the spirit to forgive one another as we are bound to ill affect each other from time to time but to carry this until it sets up bitterness and even hatred is um, of course to destroy the bond which makes marriage work and that is the bond of love and so my wife called me from Ghana because I didn't know how to reach her to wish me a happy anniversary and uh, and to send the greetings to you this also is the 13th year of our rise second rise to rebuild the work of the honorable Elijah Muhammad it happened 13 years ago around this very time and because of that significant motion that took place 13 years ago we are here yes, sir. tonight in this wonderful magnificent um, edifice and I thank Allah for each and every one of you for your sacrifices that have made uh, these 13 years um, very 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 productive years of course, I heard my son say that the biggest room is room for improvement. And uh, I know that there's much room for improvement. And uh, all of us, uh, I'm hoping, will 
set our minds to the task of improving ourselves and improving the quality of our service to Allah and to our people. Now, this 13 years is something that <clears throat> we must look into. And tonight, for just a few moments, I want to talk to us about mission. What is a mission? In warfare, oh by the way, before I get into that, I received a fax about 10 days or so ago inviting me to Saudi Arabia to meet with Islamic leaders uh, from around the earth who were meeting in Mecca to look at the Gulf crisis to see what kind of solution we could affect and uh, I had intended to be there. I was in Seattle, Washington on Saturday and spoke for three hours, believe it or not, which is it's not easy or difficult for you to believe it. Because I think you know those kind of lectures very well. <laughs> and it was one of those three hour nights. And then we went immediately to the hotel room, took a shower, changed clothes, and ran to the airport and flew all night long to be in Washington. And we got to Washington the next morning at 11 o'clock. And we rushed uh, to make an appearance with uh, Minister Alim at two churches and then to hold a press conference and then at 5.30, I was to be on an airplane going to Saudi Arabia. And somehow, Brother Leonard had the tickets and he was in Los Angeles and got sick and uh, missed the flight. And so there I was in Washington. And then I found out that the Saudi embassy could not guarantee me space on Saudi Airlines even though we had a ticket so we would have to go to New York and take an Egypt Airlines plane fly to Cairo and then on into Jeddah and I said thank you very much I'm going back home and I said if y'all wanted me in Mecca you'd have made arrangements for me to get there And the moment I made the decision to come back to Chicago, I started feeling better. Everybody around me felt better and that it was the right thing to do. We are in a very, very difficult period, brothers and sisters. This is not a lightweight thing that is going on in the Gulf. And um, I have endeavored to hold my tongue to see what Allah would show me with respect to this because I'm very troubled by it. And I know when Allah is desirous of giving me a message, He troubles me about something and I can't seem to figure out what it is until I go and get quiet and when I get quiet, I begin listening and then pieces of things will come together. It was around this very time last year that I received a call from Phoenix, Arizona congratulating me on my anniversary. And I said, oh yes, my wife and I have been married for 36 years. And they said, no, I was not speaking of that. I was congratulating you on the fourth year 
of the anniversary of your vision. And that very word triggered in my mind that the vision was not yet over, but the vision was a continuing vision uh, with, with guidance in it that is magnificent. And even as I thought that I understood fully now that there was an attack coming on black people with Louis Farrakhan as the focus. And you know I held the press conference in Washington and accused uh, President Bush and then went on a national tour. And I have not stopped warning our people all over the country. And now in the last six weeks, here's President Reagan, Colin Powell, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, a Muslim nation, and he's planning a war. And if you listen to every word that the president is speaking, he is not saying anything about a hope for a political solution to that problem. I hear nothing out of his mouth that would even suggest that Mr. Bush is seeking hopes for and will work for a political solution. If you notice the role that Egypt was alleged or was supposed to play in the war against Libya, Egypt backed down. And the role that um, Egypt is now playing in the Gulf area is just the reverse. So this is a very serious matter so I have to go back to the vision, look at it again, because it is revealing exactly what things are happening before it happens. And there's another thing that I yet have to do, and I'm troubled because I'm not sure of it yet. So if I get quiet, I'm sure Allah will show me. And I seriously want to say to all of us, this is not something we run around talking about because when the Muslim world goes to war uh, with the wicked, then it's a serious time for all of us who call ourselves Muslims. That's right. And uh, there is a scripture that says, he who keepeth his mouth in that day will save his soul. <clears throat> so, I thought I should say that and hopefully by the 28th of September <clears throat> if it is the will of Allah I will have had hopefully that kind of communication that would make me crystal clear on our role from this point on. I watched bits and pieces of Mr. Bush last night and I've never seen Mr. Bush uh, like that. I've always seen him calm and every word measured because he felt he had Russia to deal with. But now that Russia is no longer the major threat, he appears to be a man um, that feels that there is no power anywhere able to stop him and he speaks now differently than <coughs> pardon me I have heard him speak and certainly in this joint session before Congress he was displaying 
this um, new found uh, power and he feels um, very good about the world uniting behind his lead and he's talking about a new world order and he sees himself as the leader of this new world order and you know uh, if you pump up a balloon with too much air and I'm watching this and studying the Quran at the same time seeing what I may see and I, I think Allah is showing me a lot but I don't want to speak ahead of time but suffice it to say brothers and sisters it's a very dangerous hour for the world for the entire world and even though Iraq looks like easy pickings Iraq may be but Allah is not and any general that studies warfare can only calculate on what he knows he cannot calculate on the unknown and therefore no general can calculate properly when you're dealing with Allah so he may calculate the strength of Iraq as opposed to the world's uniting against Iraq but he does not yet know why God permitted Iraq to be raised up he doesn't know God's purpose for this nation he does not know what it means in the Quran when it says Maliki Yawmiddin Master of the day of judgment Yes sir If Allah is master of the day of judgment Then he's moving all the pieces on the chessboard Ain't no piece on the board that escapes his vision or his power Yes sir So he's moving the pieces to bring about his will so the pieces may feel that they are moving themselves while the honorable Elijah Muhammad said to us of Allah and now I, I'm, I'm speaking of the great Mahdi who came in the person of master Farad Muhammad that this being is so powerful that he can turn your brain to thinking and doing as he pleases you know white folk have mastered it to a degree turning your mind and making you do what they want you to do but they never thought they would meet a master who could turn their minds yes, sir. and make them do what he desires them to do and that's why uh, the Quran says and the, they planned that's right and Allah planned and Allah of course is the best of planners so there is much that is going to happen in the world that will bring about danger and uh, the result ultimately is going to be our deliverance but the Quran says that Allah delivered Moses and Aaron in a time of great distress and that's when you are delivered mothers uh, when you are having your children not before distress but in a time of great distress is when you are delivered I happened to be at class one Saturday they they blessed me to be at the class this Saturday and I saw a baby delivered 
not an actual baby, of course, but it sounded like the real thing to me. And they went through the motion, boy, and that was some distress that sister was uh, manifesting. And everybody that has ever had a baby in the class understood that distress. And so in a time of distress, Allah will deliver his people. So don't worry about distress and affliction. When you see great distress coming to us, know that the time of delivery is right, clear, is right near. Okay? We're clear, aren't we? Yes, sir. Now, that's not what I wanted to talk to you about tonight. But I thought I would just say these things <clears throat> that you may watch the news. Study the newspaper. All of you. Keep up with world events. Yes, sir. Don't let a day go by that you don't study what is going on in the world and try to read the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, particularly his writings in the fall of America. And our Savior has arrived. And then, and of course the study guides also, and then as you read these events, see what you can read into it. Okay? And as you go out selling tickets for the September the 28th event, people want to know what is Farrakhan saying about this Iraq situation. Yes, sir. Tell them Farrakhan will have a lot to say about it on the 28th right. and don't miss it. Now, mission, mission. In the word mis mission, it comes from the Latin root mitere, which means to send, to send. When one is on a mission, one has been sent to do a specific thing of great uh, importance. And certainly in warfare, the generals plan the, uh, the battle and they have certain groups that carry out certain mission and the success of this mission could mean the success of the overall battle or war. Sometimes the whole effort of war depends on the success of one or two strategic missions. Whenever a person uh, has a mission which is a duty or a function the person or persons have to be carefully chosen that they will give themselves totally to the mission and will not weaken under the stress and the strain that attends a mission, particularly a mission of great importance. So in the scriptures, the Bible talks about God searching the hearts of the people and choosing the right person to send on a specific mission of great importance. Every prophet is a man raised and a man sent and when the prophet is sent he is sent with a mission and that mission is the sum total reason or purpose of the man's existence in the world in fact those who are chosen for that kind of mission they were chosen before they were conscious. 
that there ever was such a thing as a mission. Do you follow what I'm saying? The scriptures of the Bible puts it like this. Before you were formed in the womb of your mother, I chose you. I, in words, called you before you were formed to be a prophet unto the nations. That's powerful, brothers and sisters. This means that those who are truly sent cannot escape what they are born into the world to do. And the sad thing about the life of one who is sent is that that person does not know until a certain time in his or her development that they were born to do this or that. So they may marry and they may find when they get the mission that their wife was not up to a man of that kind of importance. Lot had a wife like that. Yes, sir. She just wasn't up to it. You know what I mean? She married the man. She didn't know he was a prophet. She thought she had married a man. She was going to settle down and sit by the fireplace and, you know, have a nice regular life. Until God got in the picture and sent the angels to the man to tell the man, uh-uh, that ain't what you here for. You here for this. Now go and warn the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. Once the man who is born for the mission meets the mission, it is love at first sight. And the marriage takes place and the man and the mission become one. So the only reason for the man's existence, the only thing that makes his life meaningful or with purpose is that he at last has found what God has desired for him to do. So now everything that is around that person is measured by their commitment to that which he is born into the world to do. So the Quran says, Muhammad is not the father of any of your men. He is the messenger of Allah and the seal of the prophets. It didn't mean that he did not have children. Do you follow what I'm saying? The value of a mission and a man in a mission is that you must relate to the mission in order to relate to the man. Now that is serious. Yes, sir. Now, what is your point, Minister Farrakhan? And I don't wish for you to think when I use the personal pronoun, I am, I was speaking uh, like uh, in the place of Muhammad. I am the messenger of God. Muhammad speaking, not Farrakhan. Muhammad saying, I am the messenger of God. Yes, I am your father. But unless you relate to my mission, you do not relate to my uh, ability to father you. So the Honorable Elijah Muhammad produced children. But unless those children related to his mission, then he could not father them. Do you understand? Ah, uh, I wonder. Because to father somebody is to further them in the development of themselves along certain lines. Your physical father put the germ there and got us here. Well, he's our father. But how much fathering of us did the father actually do? Probably very little. 
but now God has taken over the role that your father should have played and raised up a man from among us to be a messenger of God for us and that messenger is a spiritual father to us and when we relate to him as the messenger then we relate to his mission and his mission is our elevation so in that elevation he becomes a father to the fatherless do you understand many of you that have no father have related to me in that light and many of you that have never lived one day with me see me as more your father than your father yes, sir. is that right? That's right I don't claim that but you see me as that because in reality that is my mission all right now I I'm coming to something look when it is time for planting there is a certain work that has to be done time says it's time to plant then we must produce the worker that will come up and prepare the ground first for the reception of the seed is that right yes, sir. the ground has been covered in winter it's cold and the ground is hard so we have to churn the earth yes, sir. turn it over make it supple and ready to receive the seed yes, I don't know anything about farming but those of you who know farming you know that that's the process right. after you turn the earth over break it up break up these clods in the earth now she is ready to receive the seed is that right when you put the seed down you come back again and the seed is covered over with the earth is that right yes, sir. then if you don't have an irrigation system you wait for the rain to come and then you watch for the things the pests that will come to destroy your crop is that right, right. then when it's time for harvest the time says it's harvest time you look you see the fruit or the vegetables ripening then somebody has to take up the job of harvesting but time has to produce the person who has the duty the obligation or the mission we together yes sir now you've heard the saying what time is it time if you read the time brothers and sisters the time will tell you what kind of man and work is needed to be done and what kind of man is needed to work the work that needs to be done what time is it very briefly the honorable Elijah Muhammad says that we are at the time of the end of the white man's power of rule and authority over the darker people of the earth and specifically over you and me well is that true well if it's time for a certain thing to take place you begin to see a sign of it yes, sir. when a young man or young woman is coming to puberty that's time saying uh oh something new is happening then you should see a sign of it uh oh I got a little hair under my arm uh oh some sign saying change is going on now it demands a different kind of action and approach yes, sir. by the person watching the time yes, sir. Mm. well if it's time for the rise of black people 
then you're going to see signs in black people that it's time. What signs do we see in our people to let you know that white folk can't rule us no more? What do you see? Rebellion. You see rebellion. Exactly right. You don't want to go to school and listen to this foolishness no more. You go to school, sit down, and hear the teacher, and the teacher don't make no sense to you. Made sense to your mother, made sense to grandma, but make very little sense to you because something is bubbling in you. You need something different, but you're not getting it in school. So you pay more attention to the rap than you do to the rap of the teacher. Because as far as you're concerned, the teacher ain't rapping at all. Out of step, out of time. Am I making sense? Yes, sir. Rebellion is taking place. Letting you know that the institutions that held power over the minds of the people are weakening in their ability to hold the people. That's telling you it's time now for a change. Yes, when it is time for a change, time produces the man who will bring the change about. Yes, sir. In Sandersville, Georgia, a child was born. It looked like an ordinary child, but as the child began to grow, the mother knew this was a strange child. She had many children. This was the seventh child and very strange. She named the child Elijah. Elijah and their slave name was Pooh. And she brought little Elijah to church. But little Elijah was sitting in the church watching his daddy as a preacher, but seeing something different. Elijah was a child of destiny. When he moved from Macon, Georgia to Detroit, Michigan, the poor man was disillusioned. Yes, sir. And in disillusionment, the person who has a mission may do strange things during that period of disillusionment. They may take drugs. They may be involved with a lot of women. They may get drunk and be a drunkard. You say that, look at that jab nigga. Look at just drinking all the time. Oh, he's a gambler. He's this. But you don't know that that person has a date with destiny. But the thing that they're involved in shows that they're not happy and they're bothered and then one day they hear a word like they come to the mosque yes, and sit on the front row like you did mm -hmm. and they hear it <clears throat> others are listening to it also That's but right. they don't hear it like this person this person hears it and comes alive immediately say ah, this is what I've been looking for all my life uh-huh now all right good now you hear, what have I got to do to be a part of this? Then you say, oh, I got to clean up my life. And that becomes easy. You throw down the whiskey, you throw down the wine, you throw down the reefer, you put down the sisters, you put down the brothers. You get yourself together. Well, what's happening to you? A change is taking place in you now. Your mother begins to look at you and say, what's happening to my son? What's happening to my daughter? My daughter ain't the same anymore. They must be brainwashing them down at that place. Stay away from that place. Do you hear me? If you go near that place again, I'll put you out of my house. I'll throw you in the street. You can't go down there and hear that fire con no more. But you hear all of that and you say, well, Ma, I don't care what you say. I know I found the truth. Your mother said, well, if you go there, you're out of here. Say, well, I'm just out of here then. When you find yourself developing the strength to walk out on your mother, walk out on your father, walk out on your sister, walk out on your brother, walk out on your wife, walk out on your husband, walk out on your family, walk out on all the things of yesterday. And something is moving you now. It's bigger than you. It's bigger than you. It is... It is as though you were a seed laying dormant mm -hmm. and finally you heard the right word, the right thing and you began to blossom and in your blossoming those around you don't understand what's happening with you because they didn't know what you were born for in the first place. There are many people that grew up with you and said, well I, 
I knew you were kind of strange, you know, when we were growing up. You was always talking all that old black stuff. And when we was growing up, you always had a different kind of mind. And your own brother or sister will say, yeah, nigga, I, I know you was crazy from the beginning. I watched you, you know, you would be sitting there. We would be looking at TV and nigga, you be crying over something somebody did to some old jive nigga. And I'm, well, now I know, know what was wrong with you. In a family, God don't pluck the whole family. He may pluck one person out of a whole family. And when he plucks you, the rest of the family say, oh, the nigga done went crazy. And they turn their back on you, but you don't care. That's when you know you're born for something. When you can walk out and don't care what people say. Don't care what they do. You found what you've been looking for, and I'm dead on course now. That don't mean they're not ups and downs. That doesn't mean they're not disappointments. But what it does mean, you have found what you were born for. Yes, sir. And if you turn your back on what you're born for, then God begin to whip you until you get your act together because he's not going to let you go until you do what you're born to do. Yes, sir. Yeah. Isn't that something about Allah? You read about Jonah in the Bible. Yes, sir. To get that back. Jonah trying to run from what God yes, had for him to do. Just right. hanging out. Partying. God said, Jonah, I love you, but you sure messing up. Jonah's running. Yes, sir. <coughs> Jonah jumps on a ship. God said, uh-huh. He sends a storm. Everybody on the ship praying. God don't hear nobody. Jonah's in the bottom of the ship sleep. They wake him up, say, man, a storm, pray. He said, oh, it's nothing but God. He's after me. He's after me, boy. He don't even let me rest at night. I'm trying to sleep. And he rocking my boat. And rocking the boat only means that wherever you go, when you try to run from your mission, see, God will rock your boat. Yes, sir. That's right. You'll be sleeping, thinking everything is all right. He'll send a storm and rock your boat. Don't nobody know why your boat is being rocked. But when they wake you up, you know exactly why you're in trouble. You're in trouble because you're running from something God wants you to do. Yes. And until you make up your mind, God, I surrender. I'm through fighting you. I'm through running. I submit to the Lord of the worlds. From that point on, yes, sir. yes, there'll be trials. Yes, there'll be tribulations. But now you have come home to your mission. And the mission and the man become one. The mission and the woman become one inseparable. Yes, sir. And maybe you got a mate that ain't right. Maybe the mate don't want you in no mission. Well, you try like lot, you know, baby, we can make it. <laughs> I better take a drink of water on that one. <laughs> <clears throat> But sometimes it doesn't work. So we have to be separated from these weights that drag you down. Yes, sir. And then you need to find a mate that will not only marry you, but marry the mission yes, sir. that God has birthed you into the world to do. Now, coming uh, to that point in our little short talk I come now to the words of Jesus when he says to his disciples take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I am meek and lowly of heart and ye shall find rest 
unto your souls and then he says take my yoke upon you for my yoke is easy and my burden is light why is your yoke easy Jesus because I was born to do what I'm doing and therefore it's not a burden to me it fits me well when one is born to sing they sing effortlessly yes sir it does not mean that they don't have to practice it does not mean that they won't fail sometimes in their effort but what it does mean is that what you're born to do is not a burden it's easy and the burden is light because you're born to do exactly what you're doing and when you're born to do it you love to do it and when you're born to do it and you love to do it you draw life from doing what you're born to do and you give life by doing what you're born to do yes sir when you listen to luther vandross yes sir oh the man is a singer he's not just a singer he's a singer's singer anybody who knows anything about singing yes. will listen to luther vandross and say now that's my man the man can sing that's right and to listen to him he does it effortlessly sick or well it makes no difference i mean the man can sing that's right and you can tell that he loves doing it and since he loves to sing when he sings he makes us love his singing and he is infused with life by our acceptance of his song See? well so it is with a person born with a mission the honorable Elijah Muhammad is the most special human being that ever lived yes, sir. I'm gonna say that again the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was and is the most special human being that ever lived. Why do you say that, Brother Farrakhan? Because once every 25,000 years, there is a change. Once every 50,000 years, there is a universal change. That's right when there is a universal change there's a man born of universal magnitude to bring about that kind of change but this is not just a universal change this is the manifestation of the will of him who originated the heavens and the earth over 72 trillion years ago then a man would be born to perfect his creation good god almighty now i want you to think now when god consistently in the quran uses the soft pronoun we yes sir and we adorned the lower heaven <coughs> with stars and we did this and we did that who is this we god doing all right creating the heavens and the earth when it comes to man he said let us make man so there is now a group of like-minded persons accepting a duty and a mission directed by a supreme director and those persons are saying and we adorned the lower heaven with stars god is talking with his agents of work yes sir in his company and we did this and had we wished to take 
a pastime from before ourselves, we would have done it. Nay, we cast truth at falsehood till we knock out its brains. We who? Who is the we? <clears throat> As in the beginning, Allah created himself. As the Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us, out of total triple darkness and created us out of that darkness. And then he said, we, he said, the powers of the heavens and the earth are from us, the original people. Now, as it was in the beginning, so it is now in this time of universal change there has to be one raised and one sent yes, sir. and that one must now raise a people that will accept the mission and say and we yes, sir. did such and so and we will do such and yes, so sir. Yes, sir. so i mean this is not for everybody this is just for the few who are called and chosen and born to do this work yes sir now the what is the work what is the work look it's, if it's time for the white man to sit down the white man is not going to sit down until the next ruler stands up all right come on talk to us you don't expect the white man to just say, well, yes, my time is up. I'm leaving. Thank you very much. Adios. No, 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 no. The white man is not going no place until his replacement is in place to challenge him for the place. Come on. How can you challenge anybody for your rightful place if you are dead? to the knowledge of yourself and your place so somebody has to come to raise you and me from the dead yes, sir. that's the first work yes sir raise the black man up i don't care what you're doing what your particular work is that work is not more important than the work that god and the messenger wants to put upon us don't you dare put your profession i'm a doctor i'm a lawyer i'm a teacher i'm an accountant i'm a business person i'm a banker i'm a lawyer i'm a this wait a minute i didn't call you to no damn law no business no bank what the hell is that to the work that is in front of us i want you to listen to me good yes sir all of that is good but it is secondary yes sir the first work is to raise the dead well what does that mean do i have to give up my my role as a banker or as a book uh, 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 um, not a bookmaker but uh, maybe that too a bookkeeper uh, a certified public accountant a teacher should I give up my work I didn't say that but what I am saying is that you must recognize that your work is not more important than the mission of the resurrection of the dead what you got is a job that a white man put you on what the hell is that but to keep the white man's world up you got a job he gives you money to keep you going in his world god wants to build a new world out of you and me somebody gotta take up the mission And many of us are running we know the truth but we're running from the duty yeah well I, I mean next week you know later <laughs> yes. next year <laughs> you know well, I'll, when I get some money I'll be back to carry on this work but right now man, I got to make me some money you know what I mean I give me some money we're right we got to all have some money but Allah promised money yes, good homes friendship 
in all walks of life but he said you must do the first work and the first work is the resurrection of our people I was a musician and I think I was pretty good well not say anybody would say that <laughs> about themselves but I, I thought I was pretty good I had a lot of talent in the field of music but I had to give it up to accept the mission now that was very painful because music was my life I knew nothing but music the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that's fine brother I wasn't in the mosque 30 days before a decree came down from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad it's either music or me and all the rest of the musicians in the mosque left the mosque I was the only one that stayed and gave it up and chose the messenger and the mosque over the music and I didn't know where I was going I didn't know what I was going to do for work because I wasn't trained in any other field but music and you would have laughed to see me loading trucks didn't even know how to pick the thing up I had strength but if you don't know how to do what you do you look crazy and I was the craziest looking worker you've ever seen in your life I got fired from every job it wasn't because I was late I worked hard but I didn't work good <laughs> your little brother was cleaning toilets this is the truth man I didn't care what the job was I wanted to take care of my family yes sir I was not gonna steal but I knew I had to work white folks had jobs I didn't know how to make a job for myself so I went to work that's what everybody got to do if you can't make a job for yourself you must find a job but the job should not be the number one thing on your mind the number one thing on your mind should be what you have accepted the truth and to look at your people out there suffering and saying oh we've got to raise our people up from this terrible condition and everyone must be committed to that work yes sir that's the work that makes all other work meaningful but without the work of the raising of our people no other work is significant what are you going to tell Allah you know I, I'm a banker Allah I, I'm a doctor you know I was I was busy in the operating room you mean to tell me I gave you some truth and these people out there dying for the lack of knowledge and you put that work above my work that I called you to do think about how you going to answer a word that raised you up cleaned you up stood you up made you up now you too busy Come on. to help your brother get up Come on. don't you love for your brother what you love for yourself yes, sir. of course you do but you're running from your duty many of us just running skipping ducking dodging dancing okay I, I want to close because I don't want to you know wear you out <clears throat> on myself but brothers and, and sisters God knew that it's time for a change and he wants us to lead the change and look at Reagan there's going to be a new world order and, and I mean Bush and Bush is taking your place he, he wants to lead the world off. Yeah. God is saying, uh-uh, I chose the black man. Yeah. Well, he chose the black man. Look what your brothers and sisters are doing. They're boogieing, they're partying, they're rapping, they're dancing, they're popping. They don't even know that they're chosen. Why don't they know? The scripture says, how can they know except they have a teacher? And how can they have a preacher except he be sent? somebody has to give somebody a mission 
And somebody has to accept the mission, become one with the mission. And the mission is the person's reason for living. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad, one day I was playing a play that I had written called Organa, a Negro spelled backwards. And we were at Dunbar High School. And the Honorable Elijah Muhammad slipped out of 4847 South Woodlawn and slipped into the balcony to see Brother Farrakhan playing and singing and dancing. And oh, I was having a ball. And they told me my leader and teacher was up in the balcony. I really showed out, you know. <laughs> <laughs> And the next morning, I got word that he wanted to see me for breakfast. Now in my play, there was a beautiful black sister, Muslim, who played the part of a prostitute. There was a brother who played the part of a homosexual, you know, in, in the play. And we were showing how the teachings, you know, straightens up everybody. And uh, there was a song that I sang called Look at My Chains. I collaborated with others to write this song, look at my chains, and I recorded the song. And it's a very sad, sad song. It's about slavery. And I came out, you know, in my chains. And I remember my daughter, you know, Betsy Jean, your captain. When she was a little girl, I was playing this in Symphony Hall in Boston, Massachusetts. And she was sitting in the audience and saw her father come out in these chains, you know. And, and I was playing that thing jam up. She got up out of the chair, run down the aisle to come get her father out these chains, you know. <clears throat> yeah. Her aunt had to come and grab her. Tell her, no, 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 daddy's not in them chains. It's just a, just a play, you know. But to her, I was playing that thing too real. My daddy up in them chains. <laughs> so anyway, when we did it at the Dunbar High School, the messenger called me to the home. And the next day, I had coffee with him. And he took me into the living room. And he said, brother... He said, uh, I enjoyed uh, the, the performance last night. I was all bubbly. Thank you, dear Holy Apostle. <laughs> <laughs> and I know how you feel by me because God has blessed a, a ratio, you know, to be that I was by him as you are by me and just for him to be pleased with what I was saying just inspired me yes, sir. but then he, he came with the next word he said brother in your play he says your play will probably make one day about 16 or 17 million dollars for the nation, your play and your songs. He said, but <clears throat> he said, I don't want ever to see any of my sisters playing the part of a prostitute. He said, in order to act in such way, you have to put your mind in such way. And uh, it's so difficult to raise our people up from that condition that if you cause them to act like that, you are sending them back into that which I'm trying to raise them from. It was very heavy, heavy. And then the brother that was playing the homosexual, he definitely ne never wanted to see a man play that part. He said, because when one is a homosexual, it takes God himself to turn you back around and make you what he originally intended that's for the male and the female you cannot come out of homosexuality without the help of God nor can you come out of drugs without the help of God so if 
the mission of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was the reform of our lives. He certainly did not want me producing a play that had our people playing the same part that he's trying to get us to come out of. Do you follow what I'm saying? And then he said, uh, uh, Brother, I really like your song. He said, you had everybody in the audience crying. And then he said, you know, brother, one day I was teaching in Detroit and my subject was the prodigal son. And when I finished teaching, everybody in the audience was crying. And when I got home, Master Farad Muhammad asked me, how did I do? And before I could answer, one of the other guests said, oh, he did so well. He taught so today that everybody was just crying. And Master Farad Muhammad said to him, brother, don't make my people cry. He said, they have cried enough. I have come to wipe away their tears. And so he told me that when I did something, it should be to uplift the people and not to put them in the position of remorse and grief and sadness. And then he got to the punchline. Well, he was working on the punchline all along. And guess what the punchline was? The punchline was... Brother Farrakhan, I would like you to give up this music all together, all together, no more. He said, I know that you are good at it, I know, and you think that this is what you were born for. He said, but you have a spiritual side that this side will keep you from getting acquainted with. He said, your mission, your work is spiritual. Give this up. And I promised him right then and there that I would give up my music and what I did <laughs> I went into a recording studio and I recorded the songs and when I sent him the recording of the songs he was angry the next time he saw me I thought you told me you were going to give up this thing I said, I did, the Apostle. I just went into a recording studio to record it, uh, that we might have it. But I'm through with it. He said, well, all right then. He never said the music was good. That was the end of that. Uh, I'm not saying that to you, Sister Patricia, or to others. Give up your music. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is, get on with the mission. Yes, sir. The mission is not singing. The mission is not dancing. The mission is getting the message of life to a dead people that they may come up to do that which Allah wants them to do. Yes, sir. That's the mission. When I gave up music, I did not know where I was going to turn. I was a minister then, but I was singing and ministering, playing and ministering. And I mean, the mosque was full of people. And I don't know whether they were coming for the singing, the dancing, the playing, or the ministry. But I know when I stopped playing, 
and singing the mosque you know kind of narrowed a little bit because people get frightened when you get too serious and it looks see a mission and a person committed to a mission is like a slave and our experience in slavery has been so bad we don't ever want to be perceived as a slave again so we run from a duty that binds us have you noticed that you can come to the mosque and you get involved in the work and then you get frightened oh, what's happening to me I'm changing so fast nobody recognizes me <laughs> I'm doing what everybody else is telling me to do. It's like I'm losing my personality. And you get frightened. Because it's like somebody else is taking you over. And you're not sure of whether this is right or wrong. And you, you get frightened and you step back. All of a sudden you don't come out anymore for a while. You back up and start hanging out with your old friends. And getting back into your old habits. And then all of a sudden, God will come and smack you upside the head. Mop! Oh, hell. I, I'll go back and slip in around the mosque. And you sneak back around. Assalamualaikum! <laughs> and then if the captain don't say anything to you, you slip in and act holy. <laughs> but you know Allah wants to say it's all right we all go through those things you get frightened <coughs> I was getting a little frightened because I was changing so fast nobody recognized me no more I got so fierce as a Muslim I was almost well taken over running snatching police and all kind of stuff I mean I had gotten fierce man I'm telling you the truth that I was a captain you know before I knew what minister was I was a captain and I was a hard captain I mean I had the soldiers popping because I loved the soldier I'm just telling you man I lived this thing my poor little wife bless her heart we didn't have no washing machines and all that kind of stuff. I didn't know nothing about no Chinese laundry. We didn't know anything about no Chinese. We didn't have no money to give no Chinaman to do our shirt. My wife was tingling one too. <laughs> and we had to have a white shirt going to FOI. We had to have a white shirt on Wednesday and a white shirt on Friday and a white shirt on Sunday. And I would come in for my little job, job, and my shirts would be in the tub, soaking. She had a scrub board and had to wear her hands out, getting that dirt out the collar and out the, the sleeves. I couldn't afford a nice shirt with cufflinks. Any white shirt would do. And I was telling the brother, I walked in a store the other day and I bought three suits. And they were good suits. Yes, this is one of them I got on. Yes, sir. Oh, wait, 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 wait. I'm just saying something to you. For nine years as a minister, I never bought a new suit. For nine years. I used to wear old suits. I don't know whether they came off a dead man or what. I would buy them in the pawn shop, $5, $10. Out of the trunk of my brother's car, they never did fit right. Because when you buying something in pawn, you got to make it, you know, it do, you know, share hanging off the shoulder, baggy in the pants. You should have seen your brother. I was a wreck. But I was a Muslim. I was jamming hard. I'm giving the brothers calisthenics. And when I got out on the floor, they could read the funny papers. And the soles of my shoes, man. Therefore, I had to get some money together to buy me a pair of shoes. Nine years I was like this. 
but I never broke stride. I kept on going. My wife couldn't have no new bedroom suit. We didn't have no money. I don't like debt. I don't like no white man telling me you owe me. And nigga, where's the payment? You know, if you start pressing me, I'll beat your behind. That's the way I feel, man. You don't take away my manhood. Come on. Elijah Muhammad was making a man out of me and if you try to make me a punk, I'll kill you. I don't give a damn who you are. Don't try to punk me off whether you're a captain or lieutenant. I'm a man, goddammit, and you treat me like a man. Nobody joins Islam to be made a punk. We come to be made into men and women that will show the responsibility, but not to be berated and mistreated. That's right. That's right. You understand? I don't like that. Yes, sir. And I don't like no white man telling me what I owe you. When the nation fell, I bought two guns. I lost myself. <laughs> Moved me here to Chicago over there on the west side uh, in Beverly Hills. I didn't know what them crackers do over there. And they gonna throw bricks and stuff in my window, nearly kill my granddaughter. I bought me some guns. Yes, sir. And I went to the police station and had a meeting with the police captain. I said, now some of your white people threw some bricks in my window. And uh, it seems as though you all don't know how to make examples of your own. I said, so the next one that throw a bottle in my window, I'm gonna put a bullet in his ass ass. And it's just the way I said it. I'm not lying to you. I was savage as hell. But I want to let you know that a man is going to be a man. I don't give a damn. If we live or we die, we got to stand up like men. Do you hear what I'm saying? And the same go for women. When Allah gets in you, you don't fear nothing. You don't fear nobody. You'll take a damn elephant and take his, his snout and beat his behind with his own snout. When Allah get in you, when Allah gets in you fair, fear goes out of you. When you fear only Allah, worship only Allah, bow down to nothing but Allah. That's when you start becoming a man and a woman and you're ready now to accept your responsibility. Nothing comes easy that's valuable that's right. in life. And my wife and I suffered, but I didn't even know I was poor. Now you know that's something. When you don't know there's another food but beans, and you don't know you're poor. Sister Clara Muhammad came, this is the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's wife, came to our house, and when she saw the way I was living, she cried. I didn't see her crying. I thought we were living pretty good myself. I mean, I was, if she had seen the way I was living a few months before, now she'd have really cried. I found an old frame where I was working. And I was working in the garment district and I had it reupholstered and made a living room set for my wife. I could not afford nothing new and she was not going to tell me. I don't sleep in no used bed. Baby, you sleep in this or you sleep nowhere. A man got to be a man, man. That's all there is to it. You can't be no damn punk and be a Muslim. And the thing that's wrong with us as men is that we are giving our women babies and then allowing them to work. Come on. 
And in the old days when Ambi Elijah Muhammad was here, we never had no working woman when the woman was a mother. She stayed home and looked after her children. But a man got to bring in what it takes. I don't know how in the world we're going to make it today. We don't have the right attitude. We don't have the right mind. We don't have the will to conquer. Yes, sir. And without that will and that mind to conquer, you'll never be nothing. That's right. And you didn't come in here to be nothing. That's right. We came in here to make a change in our lives. I went and I bought a rug for twenty dollars. Oh, used rug, but it was all right. We cleaned it. We bought an old mattress. We washed it down, fumigated it, then covered it and slept on it till I could do better. Don't force the man to get into debt when you know debt is slavery. Just so you could look good for a minute and suffer when you can't pay the bills. Who are you trying to please? Don't force the man to get into debt when you know debt is slavery just so you could look good for a minute and suffer when you can't pay the bills who are you trying to please start small and grow large like everything else does but if you want everything right away you don't want to work for nothing you don't want to sacrifice to build nothing you will never have nothing and you won't have a man because a man can't be a man when he's saddled down up to his neck in debt with a dissatisfied woman who don't give a damn she want more and more and more let me tell you something woman we ought to take you and throttle you I'm just telling you straight up you don't want no man like me you couldn't live with a man like me because I would not take that damn foolishness from one of you for one minute I drive you through the door I don't like no woman to dominate no man and I don't like no woman who even tries then you see another side of me This is the way I was trained as a Muslim. Yes, sir. You can see it coming out of me now, right? <laughs> and I'm telling you, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad knew the black man and woman, and he knew how to train us better than any black man that ever lived. And unless we follow his guidance, we'll never be what we're supposed to be. You'll never be a happy woman dogging your man out. He's not a man yet, but he will be. But if you keep on dogging him, you won't have nothing. And you'll end up being a lesbian at home with yourself. With no man by your side because your damn mouth. Is what it is. It's a snake pit. And a man can't live under that. Because he got enough hell on his head as it is. Trying to function in a white man's world. And he needs a wife that has compassion and understanding. And that's the value of the MGT. The MGT is supposed to make you a woman. To help you make a man for God. I'm not angry with you sisters I'm just talking I'm almost finished some of us want to see the black man up but we don't want to suffer 
We don't want no privation. You see the minister with a suit looking nice now, but you don't know how I looked 20 years ago. My wife was with me when there was nothing but beans. And we grown men with families. We didn't have no a lot of money, but we learned how to make little do. And that was the majesty of the teaching of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Because when you got a mission, you don't feel the pain of poverty. That's right. You know that there's a God that will make conditions better as long as you submit yourself to do his will. He's not going to let you down. I'm a living witness of that and so is my family. My wife used to have to put Salvation Army clothes on my daughters. I'm just telling you the facts of life. I was a minister, but we were raggedy. We couldn't go downtown and buy no beautiful slip for my daughters. Whatever the Salvation Army had, we take it and clean it, wash it and iron it, and they look like new. But that's the way we came up. Now all of a sudden, some of us don't have anything, but we're so proud. You got to be in the shopping mall spending what you don't have. You don't know how to sit down and pool what little you have and find the places in the city that you can buy good cheap to save your family and your money. A mission and a man and I say this in in conclusion I don't want you to think that I'm upset with anybody here because I'm not you know but I'm reflecting on the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and I'm reflecting on the way I was trained by him and I thank Allah for that training Some of us don't know the value of what we have until we lose it. And I respectfully suggest to all of us, you know, you are valuable. You are very valuable and what you have is exceedingly valuable. But you must put it to work. Yes, sir. You must develop a sense of mission. Now, I'm going to close now. But beloved brothers and sisters, look. I did not know that I was born to do what I'm doing. I had no idea. I thought I was in the world to play music. I didn't know nothing about raising no dead or leading people anywhere. I, I, that was not what I saw myself as in this life. When I came to follow the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, I didn't come to follow him with nothing in mind but just to be a good follower of a great, 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 great leader. When I saw that man, it was like love at first sight. I knew he was the man I was looking for all my life. I committed myself to him. I really, truly loved this man and loved his mission and love you which is his mission yes, so when the scripture says take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I am meek and lowly of heart I'm living that I've taken the yoke of the honorable Elijah Muhammad on my shoulders and I'm learning more about him every day that I live and in every day that I live, I realize how much of nothing I am and how great Allah is. And only with the help of Allah can a mission as dangerous and as magnificent as this mission, can it be accomplished. Only with the help of Allah. But I can't do it by myself. So I called you. What did I call you for? I called you 
hoping that you, like me, would have a mission. Accept a mission and grow to accept the full responsibility of raising a people up from the dead. And that's what the mosque is. The mosque is a place and a process which is excruciatingly painful, but it is to grow us, to mature us, to accept the responsibility of the mission of the raising up of our people. That's the only reason we're here. Otherwise, this could be just a church. We have a little organ. You can sing. Some of you can sing and shout. You know, we have a men's glee club and play basketball on Tuesdays and chase women on Wednesdays and Thursdays. Yeah, it'd be just another church. Yeah, this is not what this is, brother. We don't need no church. We are here to grow in a painful process that would allow us to accept the responsibility of the mission of the resurrection of the dead of our people. That's what the mosque is. And so many come and they see they stand a while and they get weak and fall out. And you see them, they're out in the street driving taxis or, or painters or whatnot. You see them, they, assalamu alaikum, wa alaikum salam. You still there? Still there. You still with Farrakhan? Still hanging there. That's right. Farrakhan still on the job. Yes, sir. That's right. I met many of you on the job and you fell out. I'm still on the job. When you were born, I was on the job. And damn it, when you die, if you die soon, I'll be on the job. I'll be on this job. I can't get away from this job. I'm born to teach the word. And that I'm going to do until Allah takes me away. That's the mission. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. I am meek and lowly of heart and you will find rest unto your souls until you the mission you're not gonna be at peace because every one of you that came here are born to do something you're born for this yes sir and when you run and God spanks you and brings you back it's because he wants you he wants you Michael Muhammad he wants you he wants you that's right See, in the truth, the ones that got a mission, I'm saying this to Abdullah Muhammad, the son of Alam Elijah Muhammad, God wants you. You can't get away. You can't run away. You can't hide from your mission, your duty, your responsibility. You were born to lift up your father. And you will never be happy in this life, son, until you are doing what your father brought you here to do and what Allah brought you here to do and that's for all of you you ain't just here to wear a long dress and look nice and pretty you're here to become a transformed black woman as an example to all black women and then your duty is to help me with the women get them up brothers you don't just go out and get lost found brothers i'm happy to see all the brothers that come but what about the sisters y'all don't know how to get a sister and bring her in well now nah, i was waiting for you to say that brother uh -huh. <laughs> brothers I want you to go get the brothers but go and get the sisters too sisters go get the sisters but go get the brothers too now don't get caught <laughs> I'm going to get brother so and so 
and brother so-and-so end up getting you. And it's the same with you and these lovely sisters. You're going to teach them. That's it. Uh, well, I guess uh, I didn't say all I wanted to say, but I guess you can't say it all in one night. But what I'm trying to say to a man that realizes he got a mission, don't just marry a woman because she's a woman. <clears throat> you got to find a woman that's committed to what you are committed to. <laughs> you remember how the scripture said Lot had incest with his daughters? You don't believe that a prophet of God had sex with his own daughters, do you? The Holy Quran don't support that. You know what that means? Lot had a wife that was a rebel. <laughs> but from his mission, he fathered spiritually women into faith. And then he went in to the women of faith and produced offspring of faith. No prophet of God would ever violate such law. So brother and sister, I hope that tonight you will understand something about mission. If my wife could not accept my mission, she would have got rid of me long time ago. And if my wife just married me for money, <laughs> she'd have been gone a long time ago. You do not know the pain of a woman who marries a man that has a mission. Because she'll always feel that the mission is before her. And it is. And there's no woman that can compete with a man and a mission. God gives the mission and God gives the wife. And the wife should be to help the man in the mission not try to compete with him. Some sisters say, if it were another woman, I could fight that. But this man talk about he's at the moss all the time. And maybe he is, and maybe he ain't. Brothers, don't use the moss as an excuse not to be dutiful to your wives. Because if we have wives, we have a duty by them. That's part of the mission too. But the first work is the resurrection of our people. Yes, I'll close by saying this. Two things. I was with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad one day. My wife was at the table. And Sister Clara Muhammad was at the table. And my wife was complaining about me. To the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And she said, Dear Apostle, my husband leaves me and goes into a hotel for three days fasting and what not and I don't think it's fair 
Sister Clara Muhammad immediately got angry, not with my wife, but with me, and said to me, my husband went through that so that you wouldn't have to go through that. What she was letting me know was her great pain when her husband was on the run from the hypocrites and ended up in jail for five years. Well, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, Oh, Clara. He said he's only fasting and praying and studying to get closer to Allah and the work. He knew what I was doing, but they didn't understand. I would leave my wife and check into a hotel, pull the shades down, lock the door, and I would not see the outside of that room for 72 hours. I would not communicate with nothing or no one for 72 hours, and for 72 hours I would neither drink water nor eat food. I would pray and study and on the third day I would emerge from that room the FOI would come and get me and bring me to the mosque to deliver my subject what was I doing disciplining myself so the honorable Elijah Muhammad when he saw me doing that to get deeper and deeper into the word. He told me one day. Don't worry about your family brother. He said if you take this word. And this mission. God will look after your family. And I will say this. If Allah did not look after my family. I don't believe I'd have one of them. With me today. But the word of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is true. You take the mission, God will look after your family. I don't mean that you should abandon your family. But I mean that if you accept this mission of raising your people up. God will help you and help your family. And to those of you who don't have a job, this is a job. Don't accept it to run from work, because this is work. That's right. That's right. But if you know something about the teachings, here's a big field awaiting the wide awake man to work out in. Don't tell me you don't have a job. There's a job. That's right. Come on, brother minister. On every corner. Everywhere you look. There's a black man dying for the lack of knowledge. Yes, sir. And the honorable Elijah Muhammad said, if you will go after the people, don't worry about your suit. Your suit is with the people. Don't worry about your shoes. Don't worry about a home. Don't worry about a car. It's with the people. <coughs> and I'm a witness. Everything I got on comes from the people. You serve Allah's mission. And Allah will better your condition. You run from this mission. And Allah will straighten the means of subsistence for you. And nothing you do will come out right. Because you're running from your responsibility. And so I guess it's fitting to close on September the 28th. What's happening on September the 28th? What's happening on the 28th? <laughs> <laughs> you 
You can't stop it like that. I'm going all over the country. People come out by the thousands. Talking to preachers, teachers, educators, politicians about how we can get our people to stop killing each other. And right in our own beloved city, <coughs> Chicago, this is the ninth month and nearly 600 murders have taken place in this city. Practically all of them black people killing black people. If there's any city that needs a stop the killing, not just rally, but strategy, yes, sir. it is Chicago. How is your spirit to filling the International Amphitheater with our people? How, how do you feel about it? Is it difficult? No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. Sisters, I didn't hear you. No, sir. Well, of course, there is a difficulty factor in everything. But we know how to overcome difficulties. That's what the study guides, you know taught us how to overcome difficulties. Yes, sir. Now, you know, when they said that Honorable Elijah Muhammad was dead on February 25th, 1975, on February 26th, we met in the International Amphitheater. I want to show you a film, not tonight, of part of that Savior's Day so you could see what the amphitheater looked like when the nation was at its zenith. Now, 15 years later, but 13 years into our mission, we come back to that same place. To that same place. 15 years ago, we had people coming from all over the country to fill that place. 15 years later, they ain't coming from no place but Chicago. I want you to think about that. And I believe with all my heart that that amphitheater is going to be jammed to capacity. I believe it. Now, the true believers believe it. Yes, sir. And the true believers are working their belief. Yes, I don't doubt that we have weak believers. Believers that kind of weak and had some difficulties and troubles and they're a little slow in getting into this mission. And some of them in their inactivity will slow down if the active ones allow them the activity of those who are truly active. That's right. But then you got some who don't believe at all. They are the lip professors. Yes, sir. They know how to say assalamu alaikum. But when you start mounting up something that is for the benefit of all of us, 
They try to find reasons why it can't be done. And just as you're about to go make a sale, somebody drops something in your ear. And it slow you down. I'm disgusted when I walked in the mosque. And I know the money that we paid for paint in there. And the money that we yet owe the painter. And to see paint peeling after we paid eighty or ninety thousand dollars for a new roof, and it's leaking in the school. It hurts when you give your own people the job, and your own people don't do the job well, or even stand by the job that they did. So it looks like we're going to have to put a new roof there again. Yes, sir. Because to sue something that ain't got nothing, just a waste of time. And to beat them up or shoot them, <laughs> while it may make your heart feel good, that's not the right thing to do. So I guess the best thing to do is to learn from a mistake and get a better company. But we got to get a roof on the Mars. We put too much money in there to let water seep in and destroy the good work that we have done. You agree? Yes, Our school has gone through one year it was rough the first year is always rough in anything and sister Shelby Allah pulled you through and your educators stand up sister Shelby Thank you. Sister Shelby, I think, did a wonderful job in the first year, and all of the teachers with her. Where are the teachers? Raise your hands, teachers. There they are. Let's give it to them, all the teachers. Thank you. Don't go anywhere. Now, year number two has started takes money to keep that school open doesn't it there are a lot of little things we can do to get a leg up through the winter if we work now on this program yes sir there's a potential hundred and fifty thousand dollars net that we can have in a treasury to help the school the mosque and to pay some bills and help us move through the winter people are asking uh, if that man got something to say, why we got to pay $10? Don't you pay no attention to that, brother. Sell him a ticket. Don't give one away. Not even to your mother. Get $10 from mama. Because if you don't get it, the whiskey merchant will get it, the dope man will get it, the cigarette man will get it, the number man will get it, the lottery will get it. I want the ten dollars to help raise the dead. What about you? What other excuse they have now? They 
what are some of the things they're throwing at you that you can't find an answer for? Ain't nothing they're throwing at you that you don't have answers for if you study. I want the vanguard crisp. Some of you that are a little overweight, you can't get it off in two weeks. But I want you to be working on the building. <laughs> I want you to be working on the house. I'm speaking in the bank guy. <laughs> because those uniforms are too pretty. And they don't look good on you when they tight. Because I be looking and I don't like to see some of what I see. And I don't want no man ever to think he can see a Muslim sister and put his hand on her and get away with it.